Thank you. Now I'd like to introduce Dr. R.K. Raghavan, who's the former director of the Central Bureau of Investigation in India, and he's going to chair a, a session who uh, a session that has one presentation uh, by somebody who has been working very hard on experiments in Philadelphia, uh, a, a city about the size of Trinidad uh, in population and about the same homicide rate, uh, sort of up or down over the years. So please welcome uh, Dr. R.K. Raghavan, who will put this in context. First of all, a big thank you, uh, Larry, for giving me this opportunity to be here uh, to introduce uh, Jerry Ratcliffe. Uh, incidentally, we have a connection in the sense that I went to school in Temple years ago, that's quarter century ago, and then I ran into Rat Jerry very recently, got to know him very well. I'm happy that he has, been, he has um, initiated a few experiments. I distinctly remember in the 1990s when I was there, Jack Green, who is again a famous name in, in the criminal justice area, particularly policing in, uh, in the US. He now um, is the Northeastern University in Boston. So I remember his initiating a number of experiments in which I was just a graduate student. He, he, he insisted I should be present at the various internal meetings of the Philadelphia Police Department. And uh, those who do not know Philadelphia, it's a very difficult city to police. Uh, uh, when I was a student in Temple University, there is quite a few jokes about uh, Philadelphia, especially Temple campus. You went in one direction, you get mucked. In another direction, you get murdered. That kind of city which uh, was there. Uh, it has had its ups and downs. You're not, you're not selling it. <laughs> So, what I'm told lately, Philadelphia has improved. Uh, I always been watching Philadelphia Police with great interest, and um, it has had very distinguished leaders. I'm happy. Uh, Jerry was formerly with the Met, who went to Australia for a while and has come back, and uh, he has lent distinction to the uh, Criminal Justice Department of Temple University. I'm extremely happy that he's here to present a few facts about some experiments he has initiated. I'm sure they're going to make very absorbing listening. Uh, the floor is yours, uh, Jerry. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. Uh, and you're probably wondering why the hell I'm in Philadelphia after that. Um, uh, as uh, RK said, thank you very much. And, and thank you also very much for the indulgence of allowing the program to run a little bit longer for us to get uh, to the, complete the program this morning. Uh, I speak at a lot of policing conferences in the United States, and when the majority of the audience ensure that they are armed to the teeth just to go to the bathroom, you have a tendency not to run over time when you get between them and their lunch. So thank you very much. Um, I, I did start life. I ran away from home as a 17-year-old because the circus wasn't in town. I joined the Met. Couldn't, uh, couldn't really tell the difference. Had a great time until I had a mountaineering accident uh, in my late 20s. So uh, after completing a PhD, because that really was the end of my policing career, completing a PhD, went to Australia for a while and then ended up in the United States. I've been there at Temple University in Philadelphia for about 12 years. And I must say, had I discovered at an earlier age how far you could get in the United States with minimal ability, but a British accent, I would have moved there a lot sooner. <laughs> um, to give you a sense of uh, what we've been up to, um, working in Philadelphia, uh, these are a number of the projects that we've either just completed or we're currently doing. And these are largely police-initiated experiments. And what you can see about them is that some of them have um, essentially some uh, exp exploration of the value of technology. These are things that my team and I are working on. I've got a large team of folk helping out or working on at the moment. But they also relate to some fundamental issues about drives core practices in policing. Uh, and a huge difference if you compare it to going to uh, an academic conference, if anybody's been unfortunate enough to go to purely academic conferences, uh, with majority of the presentations are uh, like being lobotomized without an anesthetic. Um, these are uh, the topics we have are much more interesting and much more driven towards the core principles and the core ideas of thinking about reducing crime, making communities safer, the sort of stuff that in a few, in a few seconds uh, Ed Flynn spoke so well about this morning. I'm going to talk about the bottom two, uh, the Philadelphia Foot Patrol experiment and one that we're uh, just finishing the analysis of, the policing tactics experiment. And you ask, wow, foot patrol. Uh, I remember doing it when I was a police officer 
uh, in the Met. It was the first thing I did on H District and Bow in the East End of London. Um, and we're still doing foot patrol in various different places. On the right-hand side, a photograph taken during the policing experiment uh, a few years ago in Philadelphia. On the left-hand side, taken a couple of years before that. You know, <laughs> you know how long it takes to get a new uniform. It just takes forever. Um, but what do we know about foot patrol? We've been doing it since 1829. Well, we've been out there on the streets doing it since 1829. Uh, very rarely looked at. Nobody had really studied it. Uh, till the Newark Foot Patrol experiment for the scholars of uh, policing. And this is a police officer at a homicide scene in Newark, New Jersey. And what do we learn from that experiment? Uh, George Kelling and others discovered that, well, it's great when you put foot patrol out, the residents feel safer, they knew when officers were patrolling, thought crime was less of a problem, and so forth. Great. What about the impact on crime? Well, unfortunately, in the 1980s, when you take car beats that were sort of 20 blocks by 10 blocks, and you ask two officers to walk around them, once they've walked down a road, they'll probably never walk down that road again for the rest of the shift. And as a result, really minimal impact and no, no real impact on foot patrol. But we have new tools. I mean, I remember going out on the streets, and my first foot patrols in 1985, and I used to patrol the Roman Road Market in Bow East London, which had a vehicle theft problem. And it had a vehicle theft problem if we'd analysed it properly on Wednesdays and Saturdays, because that's when the market was there. So what the hell was I doing midnight on a Thursday, wandering around the empty and deserted Roman Road Market? And I see quite a few of you have had that sort of shared experience. So one of the nice things about academia, well, no, I can't actually say that at all. Let me try again. One of the nice things about evidence-based policing is that we can go back and start to look at some of the sort of truisms, some of the things that we've sort of assumed through the history of policing to believe to be true and re-examine them again with new tools, with new GIS, with new statistics, and with just a new way of thinking about the problems that we have. And one of the problems, as R.K. kindly pointed out, which is going to absolutely bro my recruitment for anybody to come to Philadelphia, is we do have a bit of a violence problem. <coughs> Let me put that in perspective for you. We have a city of about 1.5 million people, and this last year we had 250 homicides. And if you think that's bad, that is our best homicide figures since 1967. We have 2,000 shootings a year. Uh, fortunately, we have exceptional medical capacity. And, <laughs> and, and as far as I can tell, terrible opticians, because nobody can hit shit in Philadelphia, apparently. <laughs> um, but we had an opportunity... <laughs> Uh, a a police-led experiment uh, to put foot patrols out in 2008. We did a bit of an evaluation for them. It wasn't very good. And we said, hey, you know what? If you ever do this again, uh, let us know, and we'll design a better experiment, a randomized control experiment. Well, bloody hell, the phone goes in February 2009. It's the deputy commissioner. They said, do you remember you said that? I said, well, we're taking foot patrols they, out. We've got 250 officers in the academy, and they're coming out in six weeks' time. Go, go do what you want to do. Go do what you do. Well, what you want to do isn't exactly true. It's let's start a conversation and negotiate. And I'll tell you what we ended up doing. But fortunately, we did have the capacity to take these brand new officers out of the academy. And we have 240 after a little bit of attrition. We were able to put out 60 foot patrol areas. They were able to go out five days a week in pairs, two shifts, 10 a.m. to 6 and 6 to 2 in the morning. And they went out for three months. So how do we put them out there? Well, we got together in a, in a way that you do sit around in an office, not all around the table, but all clumped around one side, because that's not a set-up photograph, is it? <laughs> um, myself and my colleague Liz Groff that David Weisberg talked about, Nola Joyce, the Deputy Commissioner, uh, Rich Ross, and Kevin Bethel. And we started the process of how to do this, because if it was going to be police-initiated, we wanted to make sure that they had as much buy-in and were driving an experiment that they wanted to participate in. So that's where we have a lot of compromise involved. We have an idea as academics of how we would like to set up a pure experiment. And then, but, you know, if it doesn't work out, I'm not going to get fired. These people are. So what we ended up doing was a degree of negotiation, uh, identifying crime hotspots. The police uh, captains identified the crime hotspot areas. And, you know, this is 2009. We're coming up with fabulous modern technology, a paper map and a bunch of post-it notes and marker pens. The contribution of marker pens and post-it notes to academia has been so under-recognized. All right. Uh, so how did we do this? Well, we started off with the city of Philadelphia, and we identified 120 areas. 
We're going to have 60 patrol areas. We identified 120 potential areas. And David Weisberg talked uh, a little earlier this morning about, randomize, about block randomization, and that's what we did. Uh, this is a violence count over three years for violent crime in each of the hotspot areas. I'm just showing you the first 10. And we did a block randomization process. Because think of the political impact. You have 120 areas. You have the most violent hotspot and the least violent of the hotspots. You, if you do a straight random selection, we could end up with a process whereby all the hotspot areas selected for patrol are in the bottom half, which means the top 60 most violent crime hotspots in Philadelphia don't get any treatment. Politically, not palatable. Absolutely not. Uh, and we did brief the mayor, and the police commission was heavily involved in this. So we agreed on block randomization. And that's when you take the first two, and you randomly select one of those. One gets selected for target, one gets selected for control, or in comparison here. And you continue through that process. And the idea of doing that is that you allow some political latitude that you can still run an experiment, but you give the uh, police commissioner and you give the mayor some political cover that 60 violent crime hotspots in the city of Philadelphia are being patrolled. Now, what that can do sometimes is introduce a little bit of difference. When we add those things together, you can see that the numbers actually don't add up exactly, and that's what happened. But the important thing from the experimental perspective is that we haven't introduced any bias. There's no systemic bias within this process. So it's a legitimate and sound experiment. So there we go. We have 120 areas, and we end up with those areas. The police captains out here were really happy. The guys here were kind of pissed, but there we go, that's an experiment for you. Uh, and what we ended up doing at that point was also coming up with, uh, we were able to check for displacement areas to see that there was diffusion or displacement. Now, some of the experiments that I showed you earlier, one of those is being done with uh, the FBI, and they're an absolutely fabulous organization for measuring outputs rather than outcomes. And if you're wondering what I'm talking about, outputs are how hard people are working, outcomes are the stuff that the community care about. And that's really where there's a huge difference, and it's lost on lots of people, so I'm glad everybody here gets that. Okay, so what happened? What happens here is that the comparison areas, we saw traffic stops went down, but in the foot patrol areas, where we had our young, active, new officers straight out of the academy trying to make a name for themselves and learn the job, there we go, traffic stops went up. What happened to drug activity stayed about level in the comparison areas. I'm changing the vertical scale on the left-hand side just to help the comparisons, by the way. We had more drug activity detected in the target areas. Okay, what about arrests? Arrests stayed absolutely flat in the comparison areas three months before to three months during. They went up in the target areas. And what about the thing we actually care about? Well, we expect violent crime to go up. This ran from the spring into the summer. Nothing says like enjoying a Philadelphia summer, like sitting out on your doorstep till midnight, drinking far too much, and then shooting at your friends. <laughs> so uh, we did expect, and we found at the comparison area, that the number of violent crimes went up. But what about in the control areas? And for the first time since the New York Foot Patrol experiment, we actually found that violent crime can be reduced by foot patrol. The first time we found something like that in 20, 30, 40 years or so. Now, this is where it gets a little bit more interesting. What was driving it, when we looked at the number of mapped pedestrian stops, stop and question or stop, question and frisk, or stop and search, however you choose to call that particular recipe in your town, uh, we found that pedestrian stops in the control area stayed flat. We found that pedestrian stops in the target area went up a whopping 64%. So even that we have a, a range of outcomes that show people really did work, there was a lot of dosage for the experiment-oriented people. In terms of outcome, that we have a little bit of violent crime uh, reduction, 23%. That's actually quite a lot. We did find some displacement, but overall we can turn around. And what's really nice about this kind of stuff is that we can give the police commissioner actual figures. We can say that as a result of this, 53 people were not robbed, shot, murdered in the city of Philadelphia during that summer. So, good news, tea and medals all round. Mrs. Miggins at the pie shop, very happy. Moving forward from that, we said, let's be even more ambitious. Whenever anybody says that, shoot them in the head. <laughs> because now we tried to do something a little bit more ambitious in 2010, because now we had funding. That first experiment was literally, not literally, but pretty close to literally designed on the back of an envelope with $5,000 worth of funding to fund a graduate student or two to wander around on foot patrol with the guys in Philadelphia when it was 32 degrees and you had to wear a bulletproof vest. Tad uncomfortable. Jerry's top tip, stay hydrated. Okay, kind of like being in this room. 
all morning. All right. Um, what we found was that we decided that when we went back to the police, what did they want to do? Again, a police-initiated experiment. So uh, the experimental design, we also threw in some field work, some community surveys, some office of surveys. If you're wondering what that picture is in the community surveys, um, when you survey the members of the public in violent crime hotspots and it comes from the letter from the police commissioner and they don't like the police, they tend not to respond. When they really don't like the police, they make the effort of taking your survey, ripping it into little sheds, shreds, then stuffing it in the envelope, walking to the post office and mailing it to you as a way to demonstrate their displeasure. <laughs> what we, so what we ended up doing was foot patrol again, which I'm going to primarily talk about, problem-oriented policing, and an offender focus to essentially an intelligence-led policing approach, trying to focus on that core group of serious repeat offenders, uh, very much in the national intelligence model, uh, those core group of serious offenders who really deserve our love and attention. Okay? Well, Again, we have a map, we can see we were scattered all over the city in this regard, but in terms of foot patrol, which is the thing I wanted to talk about with you today, we did something slightly differently. We had instead two officers per shift, not four. We were eight hours a day, not 16, five days a week, which is the same, but this time around we used veteran officers, good guys like Cortez and Fred, who I send a lot of my students out with in the 26th district because they're just great guys. But then by adding complexity, we make it a little bit more of a challenging experiment. Each block is two weeks, and you could see that we could start the foot patrol at the top really quickly. It's really easy to get that up and running. Problem solving is much more difficult to initiate and start and to get up and running. Uh, offender focus, that's what a lot of cops join the job for, to do in Philadelphia, so that was relatively easy to get up and running. But each of the areas, which is represented by a horizontal line, we had this in sort of challenge in terms of getting everything started at a reasonable time. And unfortunately, and this is why you need the help of bean counters, people with some analytical skills, people who can count to help you out, this did provide some analytical challenges. Now I thought about showing you some of the statistics that we've gone through with this, but instead I found this cartoon that neatly, com I think, um, neatly really sort of covers the relationship that, uh, that the conversation that I had with um, our ASC fellow at Temple University, uh, Professor Ralph Taylor, who tried to explain the statistics to me. Now, I don't think I'm a complete statistical idiot, but the conversation went something along the lines of, Ralph would say that, and I go, okay, and then I would say that, and then Ralph would say that, and at that point, I was just lost completely. <laughs> No idea what the hell the man's on about, but I love his check shirt and his Rubik's Cube, and I keep him around for just doing this kind of stuff. Good man. Uh, but we have done some kind of guru-y type statistics that uh, if anybody's even vaguely interested, I can bore you with later on. But in the absence of that, and look, Larry's here, so let's get that slide out of the way. Okay. <clears throat> Um, so, for those of you who don't know how to read statistics, Jerry's top tip of the day, if in doubt, look for the asterisk. It's the only one you have to, it's the bit you have to worry about. That's the statistically significant bit. And what we found is that the only part that was actually statistically significant is we had a 42 and then change reduction in violence when we were focusing on that core group of offenders that really, again, as I say, deserve our love and attention. Okay? We didn't get a reduction in footprint, and this is for all violence, including simple misdemeanors and assaults. When we looked at violent felonies, just the, the sort of more serious aggravated assaults and shootings, in those hotspot areas that had the offender focus, we found a 50% reduction in felonies. Okay? Um, so really fascinating stuff and kind of interesting from our perspective that if you focus on those key players and you put enough effort into that, we can get violent crime reductions so to some degree, it uh, justifies uh, the focus of intelligence-led policing. And having written a book on intelligence-led policing a few years ago, you don't know how much that makes me relieved. Um, <laughs> uh, we also found that there was uh, not a, a dis uh, displacement, actually a diffusion of benefits. Those offenders were, of course, committing crime in the violent crime hotspot, but they were also committing crime in surrounding areas but not doing it so much when the officers were knocking on the door and saying, hi, we're keeping an eye on you, and they were being followed down the road by the surveillance team, and they're being constantly stopped by the patrol officers. So what happened uh, when we looked at foot patrol? No statistical significance, remember? You can't see a st an asterisk or a little mark or anything like that. Clearly it's not important. Well, what were the differences that took place? Um, in one case, uh, in the first experiment, we had new shiny officers straight out of the box. 
Okay? Uh, pat rookies, they wanted to go out, they wanted to make a name for themselves. They didn't have any of the associations with foot patrol that some of the senior, the more senior veteran patrol officers did have. For many years previous to this in Philadelphia, foot patrol was seen as a punishment posting. If you screwed up, we made you go out and walk. Okay? Now, the rookies didn't have that sense so much. And also, we have a dosage issue. We put four officers out, we put 16, they were out 16 hours a day. For the second experiment, we put veterans out. Five days a week, two officers, um, eight hours a day. So we have a dosage issue, but we also have some of these issues around what it is, uh, what they're actually doing when they're out on the street. And I can demonstrate some of that if we look at some of the, uh, just the basic numbers of what they were doing. Firstly, there is an issue of geography here. Uh, the Philadelphia Policing Tactics Experiment, that's the second one. The foot patrol officers there, the areas, on average, they had about 23 intersections, so the areas were a little bit larger. They had a few more narcotics arrests. Traffic stops were actually down. Pedestrian stops were up minimally, less than 5%. No significant impact on violent crime. When we go back and have a look, had a look again at the Philadelphia Foot Patrol experiment, we saw the areas they were policing were much, it was, they were smaller, so we're much more focused on the violent crime areas. Significant increases in narcotics arrests, and again, there's that increase in pedestrian stops. 64% focused there. And as a result of that, these two different mechanisms of looking at foot patrol, what we end up is violent crime down 23%. So even though none of you now, as a result of RK's introduction, are ever going to come to Philadelphia, I will tell you that uh, we actually have the center city of Philadelphia is a lovely, safe area, uh, because if it wasn't, I wouldn't live there. But once you move outside of Philadelphia, it, we, we do have some problems in some neighborhoods, without a doubt. But how we choose to tackle those problems in those neighborhoods becomes significant. It's not just about throwing numbers of people, but it's about what they do when they're out there. And the experiments can help us understand that. As uh, Derlaff and Dan Nagan have said, police-related deterrent effects are heterogeneous. They depend on how the police are used and the circumstances in which they are used. So if you're at the stage where you're thinking, dear God, this is kind of fun, but I really want my lunch now. I'm just going to put my head on the table and weep. What are the points about this? Um, I'm going to talk theory for uh, a slide or two, and all I'm going to do is say people think a lot about routine activities theory, a motivated offender, a capable the absence of a capable guardian, a suitable target. People heard this stuff, yes? People tend to focus, I think, too much on the words on the right-hand side. They worry about offenders and guardians and targets. Perhaps... This tells us something about thinking about changing the motivation, changing the capability of the guardianship, and changing the suitability of the target, and especially um, in terms of the capability of the guardian. But at very least, with the exception of this, with the vast majority of the evidence suggests that hotspot policing in most of the forms that you want to try is definitely worth doing, and all of it is better than the standard model of policing. If anybody's uh, heard of the standard model of policing, that's the, the kind of random patrol route. There's, there's all sorts of academic ways to describe it. This is my way of describing the standard model of policing. You spend your whole career basically doing that. <laughs> you do that for 10 years. You do that for 15 years. And if you can hold out long enough, and 30 years tomorrow is when I join the police cadets, eventually, there you go. You get a free drink in the Rose and Crown. Uh, free drink in the Rose and Crown, a cuddly toy. Um, but uh, if you think some of this was a failure, I don't think it was. And I look at the words of John Eck because I think this is uh, really useful. These things can help us define how we want to use resources and how much money we want to spend. And as John Eck just recently uh, well, wrote a short while ago, it's the uns unsuccessful cases that allow us to see the limits of intervention, reveal where we're ignorant, stimulate us to look further, and provoke our creativity. Um, with that, I know it's been an awfully long morning sliding into the afternoon, so uh, for your attention, thank you very much indeed. Cheers. I really tried to walk away so we could go for some lunch, but... Uh... Specific individual targeting of stop frisk yes. as an area targeting. 
And I would be very grateful uh, if, if uh, only for what we are talking to our colleagues in Trinidad about. Um, if you could describe a bit more about how the local officers were able to identify the offenders they wanted to focus on, whether were pictures or other ways of briefing them, and once they saw them on the street, exactly what sorts of things they would do, recognizing it's probably fairly heterogeneous and they didn't have systematic reserves at all the time, but anything you can fill in with sort of more detail about that. Okay, um, so did everybody hear the question okay? Okay, uh, so what were they doing in terms of focusing on the offenders? Uh, a chunk of this was tarting, starting to figure out who is the shopping list of people that we want to focus on. And when you go and ask criminal intelligence, uh, criminal intelligence at headquarters have a desire to show you how hard they work and how smart they are. So they come out and give you a list in each district of 100 people, which if anybody's done early turn at 6 o'clock in the morning, I can't focus on my shoelaces, let alone focus on trying to remember 100 people that I'm supposed to be uh, paying attention to. So we made it a, a, a key part to try and whittle that down. One page, five offenders. Let's just target five people in the district in, who are, uh, these are people who are either living in or known to commit crime in the crime hotspot. So that immediately started to whittle the list down because a police district will have hundreds of offenders, any police area will have hundreds of offenders, but who are the offenders committing crime in the violent crime hotspot? So that's a good way to start. Then we kept the list relatively short and updated it as people got incarcerated. And we also made sure that there was a liaison officer. So we dragged the criminal intelligence people out of headquarters and assigned them to the districts. So there was a much closer relationship between the police districts, criminal intel, and the areas. Then we gave it to five squad. Five squad are a, a team of officers in each district who are not assigned to patrol work and they're available to do, uh, essentially they're, they're, they're the resource available to the fiefdom that's the district captain. And so they're allowed to be assigned by the district captain to particular problems without having to worry about answering radio calls or to work on particular shifts. And those officers were the ones predominantly dealing with the offender focus. And as I said, it was uh, sometimes uniform patrols. They would park outside the houses. They would do traffic stops on the offenders and their vehicles. Or it was plainclothes patrols, and they would follow them around or just generally pay attention to them. Also, digging out of the paperwork, the, some of the systems, the IT systems. Uh, I know it sounds crazy, but some of the IT systems are a little bit Byzantine. Um, who'd have thought we wouldn't have up-to-date IT systems in policing? I know, I can see the shock on your face. Uh, but we would, so it would take time to dig through those systems and figure out which of these guys have got what outstanding warrants for them, because that gives you a reason to go and uh, give them a little bit of love. So that's pretty much the stuff that was taking place. So. Apparently we have four more minutes for sausages, so we've got another, we've got four more minutes of sausage question time. So... <laughs> Uh, no. <laughs> no, this was... Um, there, there are uh, other activities taking place in the city of Philadelphia uh, that are taking place and working with partnerships. Uh, this was very much a police-initiated experiment, and they've done a lot of partnership work, uh, but as uh, Ed was saying earlier, you know, one of the, the issues, however, is nobody wants to be seen to be defunding the police too much, but social services, yeah, we can cut that stuff from here to high, high, uh, you know, all the way through. So the problem is that many of the social agencies, many of the social support services that you want to work with, uh, suffered under the budget crises in the United States in the last few years. And as a result, uh, a lot of the police, well, not a lot of them, but certainly in Philadelphia, there was a desire, you know, we can work with other people and we should work with other people. But for now, let's see if we can get our house in order and get the best use of our resources and, the, and have make the maximum benefit from the resources that we can control and to demonstrate, I think, the value that we bring to the table so that we're not vulnerable to budget cuts as well. Uh, so politics definitely plays a part in this. Fortunately, we have a police commissioner, uh, Chuck Ramsey, if anybody knows him, who's incredibly bright and very switched on and a good mayor. Um, that wasn't the case uh, five or six years ago when we had... Uh, a more interesting police commissioner, mm -hmm. and a mayor whose office was bugged by the FBI. <laughs> and when that came out in the papers, I'm not joking, his popularity rating went up. <laughs> uh, 
I didn't say it was all perfect living in the US. We've got time for one more question, I think. Right at the back, sir. wicked problems, uh, and I see urban space policing as a kind of wicked solution, um, and you highlighted sort of two issues there, which was um, the comparison between the sort of young, enthusiastic sort of patrol doses you had uh, in 2009, and then the sort of uh, the later sort of different patrol dosage um, you have with sort of second experiment. Um, how did the, um, the management of the Philadelphia Police uh, take that on board, and what lessons did they learn to sort of tackle the culture? I think one of the lessons they took on to tackle the culture was to actually tackle it. Uh, for the master students yesterday, and I, I, I may be misquoting slightly, and I, I, but I believe it's uh, John Stephen said, policing is made up of 40% of people hiding behind their desk. 40% of people that just treat it like a job and turn up and do eight hours and go home. 10% of people who are actively seeking to undermine anything you want to do, uh, even if they don't understand it, and 10% of people who are being professional, turning up to conferences, treating it like this is the job of their life that they want to, you know, their, their profession. And we focus so much on that 10%. And I think what this brought home is you can't succeed that way. There is one of those other groups you have to work with in some fashion. Uh, but as I said, you know, for those of you yesterday, cops only hate two things. How we're doing it right now and change. <laughs> So, so how you figure out how to do that is becoming an interesting issue. And for us, it's very much thinking about changing mid-level command structures. Uh, the, uh, here it would be the sergeants and the inspectors. We, uh, you know, speakers this morning spoke about supervision being important. And I think that's the issue for us. You know, you get a few years into the job and you think you kind of know what to do and you either become bitter and twisted or you hang on in there. Uh, and I think that's the issue, which is we're training, for example, uh, crime analysts. We take it, because of the hiring freeze, we can't hire civilians. We're training uh, police officers, smart police officers with degrees and good skills to be the crime analysts in each of their district. But what's also important is that we're also training the sergeants and the lieutenants, the lieutenants, how to use them. Because if we ignore that middle group, we're going to have highly skilled people here who are just going to get pissed off because the people who are managing them don't know how to use them. That requires a culture change. And so as much as anything else, we're not training them how to use the analysts. We're training them how to think differently and change their approach to what, you know, they've got another 10, 15 years to go, certainly. <laughs>